400 years ago to the year the first Ulster Scott settlement was established. The settlers arrived here at Donaghadee Harbour on the first step of their journey into a new life. They were led by James Hamilton and my ancestor Hugh Montgomery. I'd like to know more about their remarkable journey, about how and why they made it, and the impact it has had on Northern Ireland today. Hamilton and Montgomery's arrival in East Ulster is probably the single most important event in the history of the area. And yet, until recently, their story has been almost entirely overlooked. My journey to retrace their footsteps begins here in Ulster, but their tale began more than four centuries ago in the western lowlands of Scotland. James Hamilton was the eldest son of a Protestant minister while Hugh Montgomery was born into one of the most powerful families in all of Scotland. The two men hailed from the southwestern region of Ayrshire, where they lived just five miles from each other. Scotland at the time was under the rule of King James VI, the monarch who would also later rule England and Ireland as James I, following the death of Queen Elizabeth. The influence Hamilton and Montgomery held with this powerful king would play a vital role in the events that were to unfold just 30 miles away across the Irish Sea. Hamilton and Montgomery took a chance coming to Ireland. They're out to make a buck. They're upstarts. Well, this is almost like their own private empire, <laughs> where they were in control. He was granted huge estates. It wasn't difficult for the troubles to start because these two big landowners both thought they were God Almighty. The reality is it was a dangerous situation for them and they were speculators and they took a chance. As the 1600s began, Ulster had been ravaged by almost a decade of war between Gaelic Irish chieftains and Queen Elizabeth's advancing English rule. Many Irish rebels found themselves in jail, with their lands confiscated, and the east of the province was a sparsely populated wilderness. So what was it that brought these prosperous Scottish lairds across the water to the relative desolation that was East Ulster? The answer lies here, in Carrickfergus Castle. Around Christmas of 1602, a certain Irish chieftain called Con O'Neill had been imprisoned here for treason by the Lord Deputy of Ireland, Sir Arthur Chichester, and was destined for execution. O'Neill was Lord of Upper Clanderboy and Ards, and it's thought that Chichester may have had plans to secure the lands for himself. But Queen Elizabeth had died before Con could be executed, leaving the prisoner facing an uncertain future under the new king. Con O'Neill, having been captured by Chichester, remains in Carrickfergus Castle. So while the other rebel leaders are actually pardoned and get their lands back, Con O'Neill's situation is very different. He's actually still in, in prison. Fortunately for O'Neill, his wife Ellis was a very resourceful woman. Seeking a pardon from James I, she struck up a deal with the king's close friend, Sir Hugh Montgomery. The deal was half of O'Neill's lands in exchange for freeing her captive husband. Never one to pass up a bargain, Sir Hugh came up with a cunning plan. He sent over his relative, Thomas Montgomery, the Ayrshire ship owner, to woo the jailer's daughter. Thomas set his sails for Carrickfergus and his amorous sights upon the town marshal's daughter, Anna Stobbin. The scheme might sound like a bit of a long shot, but only a few years earlier, Hugh Montgomery had used exactly the same method to spring himself out of a Dutch prison after he'd been locked up for attempting to assassinate a sworn enemy. This time was no different, and the escape plan went like a dream. The jailer's daughter fell head over heels for Thomas, giving him easy access to her father and so to the castle. A night of drunken revelry was carefully orchestrated in the castle jail, allowing Thomas to sneak a rope to O'Neill. Legend has it, in a hollowed-out cheese. 
O'Neill wasted no time. Using the rope to scale the castle walls and escape to a boat where Thomas and Annis were waiting to take him to safety in Scotland. At their closest point, just 13 miles of water separate Scotland and Ulster. Today, the journey takes around two hours by ferry and comes complete with refreshments and souvenirs. But even in the 1600s, O'Neill and co would probably have taken little more than three hours to make the same crossing. I found this quote in the Montgomery Manuscripts, which is a record of my family's history in Ulster. I have heard honest old men say that in 1607, people came from Stranra, four miles, and left their horses at port, hired horses at Donegadee, came with their wares and provisions to Newtown, sold them, dined there, stayed two or three hours, and returned to their house the same day by bedtime, their land journey but 20 miles. It just goes to show how relatively easy the journey was in those days. Except it wasn't all plain sailing, the sea was besieged by pirates. Pirates aside, O'Neill and his rescuers would have sailed across the North Sea and landed a few miles up the coast from Stranra at Largs, the closest harbour to Hugh Montgomery's stronghold at Braidston Castle. Of course, the problem with retracing a 400-year-old journey is that many of the major landmarks have long since disappeared, and Braidston Castle is no different. I had heard that there was a dairy farm called Braidston near where the castle once stood, so I stopped along the way to ask for directions, and that's how I met Archie Graham, who only the previous evening had been telling some friends why he thinks his house is made from the very stones of Braidston Castle. One of the reasons we were discussing it last night yeah. was because during the planning process, the West of Scotland Archaeological Society, and they had a wee bit of the history, the, the, the bits that I've told you that they reckoned that it was a site of the, the former castle, Braid, and, and it was aimed at first, that, that was the first time I saw it as Brad Stam. Brad Stam. Brad, Brad Stam Castle. That byre was built just about the time that the castle sort of disappeared, about 1895. So it kind of makes sense that they there. basically uh, took the stone from the castle to make the buyer. I mean, that's what happened. That's what it, happened. it happened. It's no, it's no peculiar. It's no unusual. Yeah. No. I mean, there's castles. Just a couple of castles, just a quarter of a mile away, just as you go over that way. It's castles and, everywhere. Eh? It's castles, castles everywhere. everywhere. That's what I'm saying. So it was nothing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's probably the day you wouldn't be allowed to demolish it, but I mean, you, could, you couldn't keep them all. And so we've come to find a castle. Uh, <laughs> and well, this is it. <laughs> you found it, but it's not just quite a castle. <laughs> <laughs> 